It was famous for fishing, for boat building, wealth, and like most towns by the sea, very famous for depravity. And this latter trait had a devastating effect on his most famous citizen, Mary from the town of Magdala. We know her as Mary Magdalene. Mary sided with the wrong crowd in her hometown, and she started a downward slide, and eventually she was possessed by seven demons. Count them, folks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven demons. Her life became a continuous tragedy until one day a man looked deep into her soul and cast those seven demons out of her. She spent the rest of her life devoted to him. She followed him in his travels. She ministered to him out of her own substance. She endured the agony of seeing her benefactor be tried as a criminal, and she saw him sentenced to death. It was brave to show continual love to a crucified man, but that's exactly what Mary had to do. She had to be near Jesus. Her life had become a pure spiritual romance. Oh, I love that phrase. A pure spiritual romance of devoted love to Jesus. She truly loved him. All the disciples except John fled Golgotha in terror. But she stood by the cross, and not only that, when they took down his body, she followed Joseph and Nicodemus to see exactly where the, Jesus was buried. On Saturday, she remembered the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as one of our stones on Commandment Way reminds us right here, right out this corner over here. But as Sunday dawned, she took the first opportunity to visit the tomb of Jesus. It was still dark. There had been an earthquake that morning, and unfriendly Roman soldiers were guarding the tomb. But despite the danger, Mary could not be deterred. Though the object of her love was considered a criminal, she could not forget him. He had rescued her from seven demons. And she had to do something. There's little to do, but at least she can show loyalty. She can go and show that there's still someone who loves this despised criminal. So by bringing spices and shedding tears... She love, and so she's on a mission of mercy, and suddenly her world comes unglued. Her mission of mercy became a nightmare of horror. The cross had been bad enough, but now foul violators had taken the thing that valued the most to her, the most valuable thing she conceived, his body was gone. His enemies wouldn't even allow him a decent burial. Did they have to add mockery to a cross? Did they have to steal his body? It was a blow hard enough to make the bravest heart totter and so horrified, she did all she knew to do. She ran as fast as she could to get help from Jesus' two closest friends. It's good to see Peter and John together. Now here they are together. John's loving heart made it easy for him to forgive Peter, even though Peter had done a shameful thing when he denied our Lord. I remind you again, Peter accented his denial with cursing. Peter knew if he cursed... No one would ever accuse him of being a friend to Jesus. And the same is still true today. And so after Peter had humiliated himself, fell into shameful cowardice, went out and wept bitterly, the Bible says, as he started crawling back up out of his hole, John was, was there to welcome him. It's a blessed reunion. They needed each other now. Now I want to ask you a question. Look around the room, folks. There are more people not here 
connected to harmony than are here. Does somebody out there need you? Is there a friend you used to come to worship with? Is there a neighbor that you used to watch to go to church and don't go anymore? Peter needed John. Who needs you? Startled at Mary's horrifying report, Peter and John did all they knew to do. They took off running for themselves. They ran as fast as they could to see who could reach the sepulcher first. When I was a young man and I made my first trip to Israel, my brother and I, my brother who's also a preacher and I, when we got to the tomb, we stepped inside the gate and you could see the empty tomb. And my brother said to me, John, let's run. Let's run. Like Peter and John did, let's run. Let's run. I was too dignified. I was too sophisticated. I didn't do it. Here it is 35 years later, and I still regret that I did not run to that tomb with my brother. Peter and John, they ran as fast as they could. And John, being fleeter afoot, he won love's race, but he was too timid to go into the tomb. Remember, he was there when Jesus died. He had seen the spear go in his side. He had seen the death. He'd watched them take the body down. He knew how awful the body looked. And John, who was Jesus' closest friend, knew there was a mutilated corpse in there, and he just did not have it in his heart to enter. So he got there first, but he stopped at the door. Reverence held him back. Well, John outran Peter, but Peter outdared John. John looked without entering. Peter entered without looking. The man with the foot-shaped mouth was getting ready to tape control. Impetuous Peter did not hesitate at all. He landed in the middle of that tomb. He is now in charge of the investigation. If you don't believe it, just ask him and he will tell you. This is his chance. Don't forget this. This is his chance to redeem himself in the eyes of the disciples he'd humiliated. This is his opportunity. Somebody had to take charge, and so he is going to lead the investigation. He immediately jumps into the tomb and saw something that the Bible says gave him a sense of wonder. The body was gone, but the grave clothes had been left in orderly fashion. And the small cloth that had been used to cover the face of Jesus had been carefully folded and set nearby. The tomb displayed a decorum of dignity, the atmosphere serene, perfectly calm. It looked like somebody had gotten out of bed after a night's rest. Since Peter's in charge of the investigation, it's time to start drawing conclusions. Did maybe friends come and take the body somewhere else? Why would they do that? No. Jesus already had a better grave. A wealthy man had given him his grave. And also, what friend would shame the Lord by carrying his unclothed body through the town of Jerusalem? Maybe it's grave robbers. Maybe they're the culprits. No. Grave robbers would have taken the linens and left the body, especially since the Bible tells us that these linens were fine and new. Therefore, they were very valuable. Also, thieves don't set things right before they leave. If your house has ever been broken into, as mine has, you didn't come in to where all the furniture was nicely arranged and all the drawers were perfectly taken care of. You came into chaos. Thieves always leave chaos. Well, maybe it's ruffians who wanted to further desecrate the body. No. If they'd wanted to do that, they would have snatched the body in the linens and run and not taken time to leave things so neat. Grave clothes would have been removed somewhere else. And then they could have desecrated it there. So the scene is perplexing. The body had been removed in an orderly way. 
There's no signs of haste. There's no fear. Peter is awestruck, standing in the middle of this tomb, totally bumfuzzled, but he could not figure it out. But since Peter had stepped in and didn't get struck by lightning, John decides he'll go in. And so John, the one who loved Jesus the most and the one Jesus loved, their personalities just gelled. John stepped inside and he mentally photographed the tomb's interior. He could never forget it. I promise you, for the rest of his life, every time he closed his eyes, if he wanted to, he could see exactly what that tomb looked like. And 60 years later, when he wrote this chapter that we just read, that Ruthie just read, 60 years later, the sight was still vivid in his mind, and you can almost see him closing his eyes and writing as he remembers what it looked like. So now he, too, has to make decisions. He, too, saw the linens and the napkin folded neatly nearby. He also saw there were no traces of haste, and he had to draw some conclusions. Would friends do this? No. Grave robbers? No. Ruffians? No. Then who? A thousand questions are whirling through his mind. Who would leave grave clothes behind as if to say he would never need them again? In a cold, barren tomb, who would give methodical attention to little details? Who would hate to leave a borrowed tomb untidy? Who would leave behind order in a land of confusion? And who would leave behind a napkin for his loved ones to use to dry their weeping eyes? That napkin had been lovingly placed on the Savior's face as the last touch of a love faithful to him even in death. And now this symbol of love was reverently folded as if someone had appreciated and respected the love. And so John, who was closer to Jesus than any human on the planet, who was his dear friend, who leaned against his bosom at the Last Supper, John began to feel that something had happened. It's this, my, it's this speaker right here. John began to feel that something marvelous had happened. What if? Could it be? Mary said, they have taken him. But what if it's not they, but he? Had he done for himself what he did for Lazarus, for Jairus' daughter, and the widow's son at Nain? And assessing the data, John made a bold verdict based on the evidence. Jesus was alive. What, Jesus, what John was seeing in this tomb was just like Jesus. John recognized his style as easily as you and I recognize the handwriting of a friend. Don't take this for granted. Don't, don't overlook this. John all of a sudden knew he was standing on holy ground. Joseph's tomb had become a sanctuary. History's smallest and yet greatest cathedral. From here. Salvation would come. From here, people would understand that the sins of the world truly had been paid for. From here, everlasting life would be cradled. Here, 
Jesus had conquered the grave and left behind grave clothes as trophies of his victory. Don't overlook the grave clothes, folks. Find consolation there. Jesus left his grave clothes behind forever. He never appeared to anyone in them. He never reclaimed them. He rose never to die again, and therefore he never needed them again. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. And here's the great truth. Now listen. Since Jesus is not in the tomb, he's in this room. And he can live in the hearts of anyone who will receive him. And for those who come to know Jesus, the grave is no longer a dungeon, dark and drear. It is no longer the foyer of hell, but has become the vestibule of heaven. This is the great promise of Christianity. This is Christianity. Let me give it to you very straightforwardly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's my favorite Bible verse, John 3, 16. The message of Christianity is God was determined that people would not have to wonder if they're going to go to heaven when they die. You don't live your whole life and think, well, am I good enough or not? No, God said we're going to settle this. And so in his great infinite love, God the Father sent God the Son, and God the Son paid the sin debt, and now those who receive Jesus, their sin debt is covered. Those who do not receive Jesus have nothing to cover their sin. They have nothing to compensate. They have no way to pay their debt. But for those who know Jesus, they receive eternal life. And when they die, they go to heaven to be with him. Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. Bow our heads and close our eyes. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Now listen. It's such a beautiful story, and yet it is not just a story. It is an action that continues to reverberate to us. It continues to live. It, 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 it continues to have power. It continues to have influence and effect upon us. And so we come to the cross and to the empty tomb as if it happened this morning, as fresh as the sunrise service this morning, just, just new. Here we come again to marvel once more that this, our Savior, came and died for us. And maybe something was said in the music this morning or something in the message, or maybe somebody said something at work or school this week that caused you to say, all right, it's time for me to become a Christ follower. And if that's the case, I'd like to lead you in a prayer. Now, this prayer doesn't save you. There's no magic. We Christians don't believe in magic. We don't believe in abracadabra. We don't believe in open sesame stuff. We believe that a heart has to yield itself to Christ. There must be a personal commitment. And we use this little prayer only as a way to help us focus, to get a laser beam focus, and just to pray earnestly. Because one of the things I've learned about people who are considering Christ, their minds going a thousand different directions. That's a big deal. And their mind is just going every direction. So my little prayer here maybe will help you to focus and turn your attention totally to Jesus for salvation, for forgiveness. If that's the case, let me pray this prayer out loud, phrase by phrase, and you repeat it silently. Here it is. Dear Jesus, I am sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. Come live in my heart. I receive you as the master of my life. Amen. All right, everyone. All eyes here. All eyes to the pastor. If you receive Jesus, the Bible teaches us that we're supposed to make it public. In our Baptist churches, it's our tradition, been our tradition for about 200 years. It's only a tradition, but it does work well for us. Is a tradition that after we've sung the music and preached a sermon, then often we give a chance for people to respond, to come and 
to say to someone, yes, I've received Jesus. I'm not ashamed of it. I want to talk to you about it. What's next? Maybe you want to talk about baptism. Um, maybe some of you want to come kneel and pray. Maybe you want to come join our church. Whatever decision you need to make, let's do it right now. As we stand and sing the hymn of invitation, you come. Come now as we sing.